it's time to start the data quality roundtable conversation. We would like to welcome our panelists, and they are Marcus During from GBIF, Talia Kareem, Erica Krimmel, Holly Little, Lindsay Walker from the Paleo Data Working Group and various institutions. They can int introduce themselves. Um, Robert Mesabov joining us from Down Under, uh, myself, Kat Chapman, and Chris Wilson joining us from IDIC Bio, Matt Yoder, and of course, you. And to introduce the session, we have to think about this. What, what is data quality? So for example, we could talk about completeness, consistency. We could talk about compliance. Um, where does it come from? Uh, how do we build our networks that give us agency to make the data as fit as we can for the desired and imagined purposes uh, in the future? Our guest panelists today give us perspectives from the aggregator level, collection manager, working group, data manager, software provider, and data fixer angles. First, we'd like to know a bit about our audience. So we have a brief poll for you to ask you what's your place in the data quality landscape. So with that, uh, we have a lead off question for our guests. Uh, Matt, would you like to do the honors? Yeah, we're essentially um, following the pattern that we used yesterday, if you if you were here. Um, and we're going to ask our panelists to chime in. Um, please try it. We've got a large panel, so please try to keep your initial response to under two minutes. Uh, and we're going to ask you what keeps you up at night with respect to data quality. And again, as is yesterday, we don't necessarily mean this to be a bad thing. You're worrying about some part of data quality. It could be um, an exciting thing, what you're thinking about implementing, um, what kind of changes you're, you see on the horizon. So what are you thinking about? And um, in the context of what keeps you up at night with respect to data quality in your role and in your activity? I'll give a very brief start. I'll say for myself, in TaxonWorks, we um, have a, a sort of very specific data model that provides context and convention. And we try to be aware of data standards, but we don't necessarily want to constrain ourselves by data standards. We realize that science is an evolving process um, and that we need to be a little flexible there. So I spend a lot of time or think a lot about um, how to adhere to standards, but also to keep flexibility going. And with that, I see Kat wanting to chime in. Kat. Yeah, um, hi, I'm Kat. Lots of familiar faces here. Uh, good to see y'all. Uh, yeah, I'll keep my response very brief. What keeps me up at night? The first things that came to my mind, uh, data literacy or a lack of data literacy, not an individual problem, it's a systemic problem that we just throw people into these roles as curators or data managers or data, as even just data providers. And we don't properly train them on what this looks like, uh, You know, just th from the process of creating a digital specimen to getting it aggregated into something like GBIF or IDIC Bio. Like we're all just kind of flying by the seat of our pants here. And I think that's an issue. Um, in addition to that single points of failure for any given step in the system uh, or in the process, I, I can elaborate, but I, I wanna keep my response brief. Um, and then finally, just folks not necessarily understanding exactly what the role of an aggregator uh, versus, like what, what an aggregator does versus like collections management software. And you know, I'm speaking from the aggregator point of view being with IDIC Bio, the US national aggregator. And sometimes it's it's apparent that people think that iDigBio does things that we we don't, and that's probably an issue on on our end for communications reasons. But those are the things that come to my mind that keep me up at night. So I will stop there. Excellent, thanks. Uh, I think I saw Bob's hand go up a millisecond before Greg's. Bob. Yeah. That's a good question, Matt. I suppose the thing that keeps me most um, on edge is when data managers 
and collection managers are presented with data quality problems. They, they are aware of them, either because there are data quality issues flagged by an aggregator, or in my case, because, because I've given them a report and explained what problems exist, is that nothing happens. So I need to be convinced all the time um, that these things are important to the collection managers and data managers. I need to be um, encouraged, I guess, in holding up a banner of data quality. And that's not so easy when you see years pass and nothing happens. Thanks. Uh, Greg, I think you had your hand up next. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess, you know, to explain my position, I'm uh, the one of the identifiers, national identifiers for APHIS. Uh, and so I have to identify scales and white flies and other things coming into the ports uh, very quickly. And the way I do that is to have a handle on the taxonomy, the names, uh, but also I have to have a handle on uh, distribution and hosts and things like that. And so that's that's been my, that's what keeps me up at night. That's what drives me. And, you know, it's, I'm trying to, I like Taxon Works because it, it handles the, the taxonomy of it. And I would, I'm, I'm looking at it to sort of put all my eggs in one basket, you know, where I can uh, work it so I can get my distribution and host data all in the same place. Uh, so that's, that's, and so what drives me is, is just the, uh, the sor sorting out of species into regions. So I can query them uh, by region or by country or however, and that, that helps me get my job done quicker as to knowing which species are present in certain areas around the world uh, by regions. And that, if I know something's coming out of the uh, Eastern Paleoarctic, you know, that cuts down on my subset of uh, normal possibilities unless it's something's invaded in another region. And so uh, that's uh, being able to sort taxa by regions uh, is a big thing that drives me. So I think maybe we can follow it up later after we get some more panelists, but maybe to phrase it in the, to rephrase your needs, it's a very real um, concern about having the quality of the data that you're referencing be high enough that you are confident that you are not letting, you know, the spotted lantern fly, of course, that's not your beast, into the U.S. So this is a great example of a very real need um, at our borders, at our policy level, um, in the science that we do for data quality. If Gregory gets bad quality data, real life decisions um, can be impacted. And I don't want to dive too far into that. I want to keep going with the rest of the panels, but I think it's it's really important to present data quality in the um, context of the use of that data. So is does, does data quality matter in the woods um, if it falls and it's not quality, does it matter, right? If the tree falls and nobody sees it, if the data quality falls and nobody sees it, does it matter? So um, again, what else do are we losing for the rest of our panelists? What are you losing sleep about? Uh, Marcus. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, well, I'm mostly dealing with names uh, for GBIF and Catalog of Life and both aggregating them. So there's always some tactical and semantic issues with them, but I guess one of them, most of the time, I think, is to do with exchange standards somehow, because there's data aggregated from all kinds of heterogeneous sources and different systems. Uh, there's different nomenclature codes that even make names somehow be different, especially the authorship is still very unstructured in many ways. And uh, yeah, the standards I think is 
quite interesting to well, there's always the balance between having very rigid strict standards that allow to properly exchange things in a way that you don't lose information but it keeps people out from publishing data so you want something more open and lax as stuff and core as we know it with all kinds of alternatives and different representations of the same thing and that is very often introducing lots of quality problems because you have yeah because different representations of the same thing that is if i think about it it's probably taking up most of my time and causing forever and ever yeah so what we're saying is regardless of how many standards are out there or it's the xkcd <laughs> what happens you know there's one more standard cartoon um we could find a link to that um we we are never going to escape the challenge of uh unifying our world views so to speak at that level yeah. thanks kat i knew you were going to come up with that that's a that's a wonderful link um i'm watching other hands you just muted yourself matt thank you i'm watching chat now um, i'm looking for hands too but i'm also going to start looking at chat here and um i see nikki nicholson has chimed in Surprised not to see the data steward as an option in the poll outline of the data steward role from the gov lab here. Thanks very much. We could follow that. I think, um, and we do have the concept of a data steward here in the group. That's for sure. People that are playing that at different levels. Um, people like Kat on the panel, um, Erica, others who play that role at different levels. Um, Okay, Talia, I see your hand up. Hi, yeah, so I think what keeps me up this night, so I manage the invertebrate paleontology and paleobotany collections at University of Colorado in Boulder, and as a collection manager, um, data quality does keep me up at night, and there's only one of me, and I do, <clears throat> we're currently doing a lot of data cleaning, um, and it's just a never-ending task, <laughs> um, and there's only one of me, so trying to keep up with everything and make sure, um, you know, digitization project data is getting cleaned up, new data are getting cleaned up, legacy data are getting cleaned up. It's it's a lot for one person to manage. And I think that's uh, one of the things that keeps me up at night. You need some companionship is maybe the underlying. I, I need to clone myself. Yeah. Uh, Dima, I see your hand up. Uh, I just, uh, what I would say that there are a lot of people in our community who know what uh, uh, is good. Uh, however, uh, most of the people do not have uh, ability to program to automate their uh, uh, effort. And I think that <clears throat> ability to create tools uh, that uh, so I think that it is uh, the most important thing in our uh, task is um, a human. Uh, until AI is better than us, um, we are the people who know what is right and what is not uh, to um, our abilities. And uh, uh, if there are tools that uh, make it easier for people to uh, do the job, uh, I think that's. Uh, like tools and uh, in the end, ultimately a person who decides if it's right or not. I yeah, think so there's a there's a big point here to be made about if we go back in time, it's kind of like looking at evolution. So we have a time when like PCs didn't exist. And the point I'm trying to make here is role expansion. Right, where what's happened is, you know, museums had paper ledgers, notebooks, card files, right? And now they have these digital things. The digital things have to be cared for and fed. Um, that's a sort of a new, if you will, allow me to say that, new skill, new branch, new wing of what it is collections do. Is And so taking on the whole idea that museums are evolving in their ability to deal with this, that, university levels and public museums, this notion of 
who do we have on staff? How many staff members do we have in need? And partly what we see is some museums hiring more people to take on specific roles. Other museums, it's more like what you said, Talia, where it sort of gets added to your job pile. Yeah, yeah, you, you're it. Uh, and so that that is an issue. Can I'll I say, add to, yeah, Talia. Oh, I was just gonna say one more thing um, in response to Katie's comment um, in the chat about uh, a lot of the data quality issues are a manual process. Um, I would say it's a manual process and it also takes some understanding of the data itself and the collections data. And so for me, it's like, I have graduate students, we have a museum studies program, a master's program at CU. And a lot of times I can't have my collections GA do that data quality cleaning because they don't have the understanding of the data or the expertise to fix those mistakes. Um, so a lot of times it's it's left to somebody with the expertise and understanding to do that as well, which um, is a bottleneck in the in the process. <clears throat> yeah, and I just want to piggyback on what Deb and Talia are saying, and also what Nikki said in the chat um, a few minutes ago that collections work is like a, a glacier of sorts. And I I think that our funding system is really a problem, at least in the U.S., for how how we think about data quality because we have this um, system where to get funding, you need to be innovative or like exciting or doing something new. And to be honest, like we're just trying to kind of catch up. Like we're trying to get everybody on the same page. It's boring. Um, but it's that if we want to actually like, you know, Bob's saying like nothing changes. Well, the answer to that is like, because there's no one to fix things. Like there's one Talia. Bob, you had your hand up, I think. Yes. Did, did you have your hand up? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what I wanted to say is, going back to what Deb just said, that we are evolving in our collection management. Sure, we once had paper, and now we've got digital tools. But there is a, a divide that's also developed in time. And I think it began about the year 2000. Um, you can have a digitally managed collection with your data under control. And as far as you're concerned, in-house, that's great. You've got everything you need to um, manage your collection in that collection software and you've got um, no problem at all understanding things like abbreviations and special quirks of how you keep your data. About 2000, collections were asked to share their data with the world. And that's, again, an evolving thing. Darwin Core is, isn't finished yet, for example. OK, that adds a new level of data management because things that were OK in digital collection management um, in 1995 are not OK in 2024. And I'm not sure that many collections fully appreciate that once you've exposed your data to the world, people are going to pick up on things like missing but expected items and on um, non-compliance with standards and on funny little works of your data keeping, which were fine um, a long time ago, they're still fine in-house, but no longer work when you share that data with the world. So I'm not saying, I'm not uh, trying here to criticize collections. I'm trying to point out that this is another level at which data management stumbles. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I see Monique had, a hand up. Yeah, thank you. So I am involved in digitization projects at a primarily undergraduate institution. So we have like just people transcribing labels and they're like, I mean, it's not about their age, but they really don't have a lot of work experience. They don't have a lot of experience with different types of uh, computer interfaces. And so I, I, I think that I have a little bit of difficulty trusting our digitization interns, knowing that they don't really understand 
how relational databases work. Like they just don't really have like the foundation of like computer information science that perhaps someone in their same shoes would have had 10, 15, 20 years ago. I mean, like the iPad baby cliche is a little real in some senses. And I feel like with this in mind, I need to be auditing their work more closely and more frequently, but I don't feel like I have the ability to do that with my own kind of limited understanding of how to query information. Um, yeah, so maybe, you know, maybe the challenge is my lack of familiarity myself, but I feel like the students that I work with, they almost just aren't I don't know. It's it's like a cultural thing where like the way that a lot of adults and professionals, later career professionals interact with tax on works, younger students and less experienced people, like they really struggle with that. And I, I'm not sure how to address it. It could it could be terrible. Thanks, uh, Monique. So the spectrum of expertise is a, a challenge for data quality. I think maybe we could sum it up. Talia, I think you had your hand up next. It did. Um, I kind of wanted to res Bob, respond to Bob's point about where we were in 1995 and adhering to data standards in 2024, because I've definitely seen that in my experience managing uh, our collections database. So when we got our first big digitization grant in 2013 and we started sharing data to IDIG Bio, our dates were just in a verbatim text field, for example. And so this is a great example of you want to query by date, but like our dates are like a hot mess in this like verbatim text field. So I shared my data to IDIG Bio and Joanna McCaffrey, who was the data quality person at the time, emailed me back immediately and said, your dates are in the wrong format. But the only reason I could fix that was because I had money on this grant to pay a programmer to go in and, you know, run a, a filter and a query on all those dates and reformat them and move everything into a formatted date field and specify because I have all this legacy data that I'm dealing with. So it takes, you know, it takes a community to fix these kind of things, right? And it takes resources and it takes expertise. It's not something that I as a collection manager can just do on my own for a hundred thousand specimen records. So you know, we're getting there. It's just, it's a very slow moving ship and there are a lot of bottlenecks in the process. And I don't think that we are um, willfully trying to make our data have poor quality. It's just a matter of resources and time and expertise, I think. Thanks, Talia. I want to point out that we did have some administrators who are some people, participants here this morning who had, who identified as administrators or policymakers. And I hope that you're hearing this message that what we're saying is that people um, need to be supported. They need to be funded. Um, if we want to build global infrastructure that is going to be critical for uh, addressing climate change, disease, agricultural food needs, that this group of people right here are the people that are thinking about it. And you're hearing from every single one of them that they need more. And that comes down to money. So. Um, I think, you know, for those of you who are in administration roles, I hope that's one of your takeaways. Uh, Tommy, I think you had your hand up next and then Fritz. Uh, honestly, I feel like uh, Talia said it exactly the way I would want to say it. So just echo exactly what Talia said. And just one anecdote to kind of support. Uh, basically, when I'm administering a grant that generates a lot of data, it's entirely dependent on who I have hired, how high quality they are, and what I can get done with the money we are given. So at the end, a lot of it, like I would love to say, oh, we delivered this many records uh, with this high data quality. Um, and I have queries that I can run to see like how high or low that quality is, but then it comes down to the end of it and it's basically, oh, I'm out of money. The data is where it is because I'm already overwhelmed and I have no one else to, I have no one else to actually finish cleaning this or adding data or anything like that. So just That's pretty much fun. echo exactly what Talia said. Okay. I see Fritz's hand up. And then after Fritz, I'm going to change and play a little bit of devil's advocate. Um, Holly, I see your hands up too, but I do want to get to a couple of other topics. And so 
Um, Fritz, we're going to go, and then Holly, um, you're welcome to chime in, but I'm going to introduce another topic uh, after Fritz. Fritz, I think you might be muted, or we can't hear you. Uh, what, what about now? now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. OK, perfect. So I, I just wanted to, to say like uh, maybe a little bit about this, like the feedback loop between like users and collection managers. I think like there's a point that has been like bring up by several that, you know, the, the collection manager are like, you know, tight in budget, like per, like how are the staff and, and tasks. And sometimes there's this stuff like, you know, we are trying to bring back like information like, okay, uh, and the thing is that, for example, for my research, I have done a lot of like georeferencing, and sometimes I think like, well, you know, there's a lot of work, and sometimes it's lost in the, in this ocean of like, well, we want to give back like to uh, that, for example, like the collections are this new georeferencing, but it's not possible just because of uh, like what's been said about like budget restrictions and time. But what I wonder is that you know this feedback is in a how to say included in, in the system that we're working with. For example, like in mind that we have the possibility of saying like, well, I did all these geo references and it's shared somewhere like in one of the aggregators or at other place that, okay, all it has been done. Maybe it's, it was not like updated directly. The, the collection manager didn't update it directly, but somebody's doing this work. If you want to check if, if that's good enough for you, you can like, have it as information. So instead of like going like seeing again, like, oh, it has not been being your reference, so we need to do it again. So we any this loop that we are just repeating work that maybe people have done in the community before just because it's not being updated. I don't know if that makes sense. I think you're addressing, I hear you addressing issues of time and process, right? So data quality at one period of time and how that evolves at different parts of the process of sharing the data and aggregating the data. Holly, did you want to chime in there? I don't mean to cut you off, um, but go ahead. I, I can be fast. Um, I was going to give a like slightly different spin. I think everything that people have shared is really important and valid. And what keeps me up at night is all the possibilities ahead of us for tackling those challenges and who's going to do the work because while everyone has their own individual challenges at their institution within their collections and the capacity issues and resourcing issues that they have, the other side of that is we can't all solve that problem individually, right? We need to have coordinated approaches because if I decide, who gets to decide what data quality is? I mean, there's some that are obvious, like a date is a date, but we have to have coordination so that when we're solving those challenges and we're improving the data quality, we're all doing it in a similar way. Because otherwise, it doesn't really matter what you're doing, right? Anybody could critique what that data quality is. And so um, one of the things that we're doing and part of a reason why I think the four of us are here with the Paleo Data Working Group is we saw that challenge and we saw a big community need to bring everybody up to speed, to have that coordination um, and to share the resources and knowledge so that we can take that feedback because not everybody's in a position to be able to do that. Um, so I just wanted to add that perspective. I think there's a lot of opportunity ahead of us, but there's a lot of work to be done to do the culture shifts that are required to actually be able to respond to the community, to the data quality challenges. So Holly, I wanna thank you for exactly introducing themes of the next question, because in my mind, you nailed it. Um, and the question is, what is data quality? We're all here hyped up about um, our data quality, this and that, but there's a lot of human computer interaction theory. There's a lot of philosophy. There's a lot of data science that says that data quality only matters in the context of the questions being answered. There's also a lot of theory that says that when you produce data, it is only meaningful in the, in the context of the questions being answered. So if we are not asking questions, if we are not doing science with our data, if we are not using our data, if we are not building communities around our data, then what is data quality? Are we just spinning our wheels? Kat, thank you for leading off. 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's two, um, or I have two answers to this question. And, you know, given, given your little criteria, of, like we're not asking questions of the data, it's just the data. And so in the context of biodiversity informatics, you know, digitized specimen collections, I feel like data quality would, would be, you know, what best represents the physical specimen and like what most accurately, most precisely, most like tr true to reality. I don't know, words are hard, but like, that's kind of where, that's where I find myself. It's like how to most accurately, most truthfully represent like what this physical specimen in front of me, in front of you, in front of whomever is doing the data entry. Like to me, that's data quality. Um, you know, and then like the other angle, which I mean, you kind of you kind of uh, said not, you know, we're not asking questions of the data, but I have the talking stick, so I'm going to make this little point here. Like the the other angle that I view data quality as is, is uh, through a lens of, you know, is this, you know, is the data that we're inputting into, you know, our our spreadsheet, our collections management software, wherever the data are ending up, right? You know, is it in a form that that is usable by a machine? Like, is it machine readable? You know, can we compute things with it? Can we ask questions of the data? Which I know you said we're not, but but we do. That's so. That's that's my answer. Yeah. To just to just echo one thing there. One of the thoughts there is, um, we want to make true statements, right? We might not want to make perfect statements, but when I when I talk about people and they say, well, what fields do I fill in in taxon works? And I say, don't worry about what fields you're filling in taxon works. Just try to fill in fields that are true, that we can reasonably assume are true. They don't have to be precise. They don't have to be accurate. We just don't want you to mislead us, right? So one of the ideas of data quality there is exactly what you said, I think, for, for our group is just represent something that we would all sort of agree is a reasonable assumption, right? Erica. Um, I, I'm really glad that Kat went first because she said basically what I was going to say too. It's like, I think the phrase data quality is dumb and divisive like i think all it does is create a situation where there's somebody at fault um quality is an inherently good or bad word and so why are we still using it um and so the word that i or the phrase that i usually find myself falling onto to describe what cat was saying is like the fidelity like data should be um we should have data fidelity and that means different things to different people as well but um I think again, from the like collections management perspective, like if we do not believe that natural history specimens have an intrinsic value, why are we in this field? Like we should all go quit and do something else. So if we believe that specimens have an intrinsic value, then we don't need to justify anything other than we're trying to create a digital representation so that those things that have value are findable. And so I think like drawing that kind of more narrow box around what what we mean when we're talking about digital data is maybe like a, or for me, it's a helpful way to think about um, my version of data quality. Amazing. And Erica, if you wanted to share what you think about in, of as fidelity, maybe in the chat, we'd love to hear more about uh, what fidelity means to you. So I'm going to pivot to Tommy. Yeah. So I, I also want to echo, I really like the term data fidelity. That's great. Um, and I'll just share an anecdote to support what's already been said. Um, when I was a PhD student, I gathered what I thought was the most accurate version of my data for a project I was doing for a revision. Um, and I then got a job, went and started uh, doing a lot more data fidelity work uh, and realized that the data I had gathered was not good enough or not fit, like it was not accurate um, because I was only gathering what I needed for my project. And if I was going to return that data, I would be misleading people as to what that data represented. Um, because I was gathering it in a way that amalgamated dates and amalgamated um, specimens in order to get it faster. But if I was going to return that, I would be returning things in a way that misrepresented the data I was gathering to the people who had initially provided the specimens for me. And so... I did not do that and I'm regathering the data. So in that case, I am trying to have better data fidelity on what I've done previously. And just to echo what was also said at the beginning, or well, sorry, to echo back to what the last question um, 
That is exactly the pattern we've seen in our data because INHS has been at the forefront of data gathering from specimens and putting that online since the 1990s. And so with each grant that they got to generate data for different groups within the collection, they either improved, they, they generally improved. I don't, I'm not gonna say always <laughs> their, their data fidelity, but I'm still fixing issues that were, they ran into in the 1990s or in the early 2000s when they were gathering data. And so now our standards are much higher. And so I am having to do a lot of things to try to improve what they were gathering um, back then and bring it up to modern standards, kind of like what Bob has already talked about and what uh, other people have already talked about. And so, yeah, when people bring that feedback back to me saying, hey, why is this not, why is this not the way it is or way it should be? I'm like, well, because that's the way it was gathered 25 years ago, who was the last person to touch it. Um, and it's not that that person was wrong. They were probably doing the best that they could at the time. It's that it's more that we now have different standards than what they were gathering. Okay, thanks, Tommy. Uh, Greg, do you have a, a comment on um, on quality possibility? Are you talking to me? I, I didn't. Yeah, know sorry, that. Gregory. Do you have what you, you had? Uh, yeah, I see your hand up. Oh no, I took it down. Um, uh, okay, I'll just take it down again <laughs> then. Uh, and Bob. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, I this is going to sound strange, but I also think the phrase data quality is awful, and we should stop using it. But maybe for a different reason than uh, the one that um, Eric has mentioned. Uh, in my mind, the good data is data that can be used for a large number of purposes. So if you can maximize the utility of your data, you've improved it enormously and you've improved its value enormously. Um, fidelity isn't as, as important to me as, yeah, okay, that's, that's great, but can I use the data? And the development of Darwin Core was um, a great step forward in enabling, um, I won't say universal, but global use of biodiversity data from collections. It's a way of maximizing the utility of data. The more, uh, instead of data quality, good, bad, how about data utility, poor, wonderful? Thanks, Bob. Um, so that, the one of the things that jumps to mind personally, when we think about utility is that that leans into, I think the points that Holly was talking about is that we could imagine setting up, I'll use continuous integration, if you're familiar with those kind of processes where we submit code to a repo and every time we submit, we test and test and test and test. So we could be using our data in our scripts in continuous integration processes, and we could set up a whole bunch of little questions that are automatically run every single time. And we could say, um, we're gonna throw out this row. If it doesn't meet these criteria, we're gonna use this. So, so use plus computation is something that we can very much fit into a, a metric, so to speak, a gold standard idea. Um, that of course has all sorts of dangers and flags. And then we start gaming our data for meeting the metric, but um, use is, you know, we're talking about competition uh, or computation often. Um, Tommy, and then I want to change and get a, to, to drop us back and get a little bit more practical to, to wrap up the last couple of minutes. So Tommy, you want to wrap up this part? Um, yeah, I just want to jump off of what Bob said. I think I really love that, uh, that idea that higher fidelity equals higher utility. And I think one way that, and I think the, the, just to make sure we know, we need to have ways to evaluate that from a records perspective. So if you're just, if you're providing only parse data, for example, the person who is looking at that parse data cannot evaluate whether or not that is the maximum amount of data that was extracted from the specimen, um, which is why I think the field or the new Darwin core field verbatim label is so important because if you're 
if you're committing to providing all of the data that is on the specimen as it is listed, flaws and all, then the person who is looking at that record can evaluate whether or not it has the highest fidelity. Um, if you're not providing that data, then you are making inferences about the completeness of that data. And not to say that you shouldn't provide the parse fields as well, because in, in when you're doing that, you're also potentially fixing mistakes um, uh, or you know misspellings, or you you see a mismatch between what's on the label in terms of county versus the georeferences um, or other locality information, and so you actually say no, I believe it's this location. So uh, it's not that we can't add data to specimens, but you need to provide the tools and the vocabulary to make sure people can evaluate that in the future. Thanks, Tommy. I'm just going through the chat. Thanks very much. You almost see a nice, wonderful, deep conversation going through the chat as well. And that's great to see. I'm just trying to see if we should draw attention to read out um, components. I feel like it's fairly contained there. Um, so I'm going to let it keep going in the in the chat. Debbie, do you want to jump I, in? Quick? I want to say we talk about the extended specimen. One comment I see popped out for me, Donna Ford, uh, where it says, uh, much use centers around phonology now when that was not even included in early data capture systems. So this notions of different kinds of data that we're beginning to want to be collected, that we're beginning to realize it's in our databases, but we don't know how to get it out, those kinds of things. Um, it, the world is changing. Yeah, thanks. That's really important. That makes me very excited too, to think about um, one of our students here started talking about um, the new kind of data where, where, the, where you do a uh, species distribution niche model where you're looking at many different levels of data. And one of the things we do is we capture assertions about occurrence data and their distribution. But now we have a new generation of students producing distribution data that's based on a process um, of niche modeling. And we'd love to be able to take that shape, which is very, very complex. It's two gigabits in size. It's like we're starting to images, image, back when we started to figure out how to manage all these images, um, we had to store them, we had to keep track of them. Now we have to start thinking about, okay, not just images, but models at this snapshot in time, and then moving on and on and on and on. So there's lots of different uh, aspects of, of evolution there too. Um, I wanna drop and get a little bit more practical. Again, if you have aha insights that you wanna share, feel free to pivot from the topic, but maybe we can quickly answer this one and we'll drop. So, for those of you who are fixing data, um, do you use data quality feedbacks that aggregators provide? So almost all of us here provide data to GBIF and they provide a wonderful set of different uh, quality metrics. Um, many of you have heard from Bob and um, with his reports on data quality, uh, IDIG Bio re 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 um, provides a lot of different data quality results. So do we use this day to day or is the theme really we just don't have time who uses maybe the question is who uses data aggregator feedback on a day-to-day -day basis maybe we could do it as a plus one in chat maybe that or feel free to chime in with a comment there yeah I would. thanks bionomia feedback as well perfect yeah another yeah, great because, aggregator because David, for those of you, if Bionomia is new to you, we'll, we'll answer that question, but he adds an, another layer, right? He makes it possible for all of us to go in and say something about a record that adds another human insight to whether or not there's an issue with the data uh, at the same time that we're adding value to the data with identifiers for people names. So yeah, plus one in the chat if you use uh, the feedback. Comes from IDIC Bio, comes from GBIF. Others here in the room? While well, people are plus one in the chat, I just want to point out that in my pastoral data bio and in my current work with the Paleo Data Working Group, I hear nothing but enthusiasm from aggregator feedback. But it's just, it's the thing on the to do list that is never the top priority. And so I almost feel like this is a terrible question to ask because if we don't get the answer, yes, I use it, should we get rid of the aggregator feedback? Well, no, like people might use it. Sometimes should the aggregators put more work into it? Also probably no, or maybe if they have time, like we're just mismatched in our capacity and priorities between collections and aggregators. Yeah, so I think Erica, for me, what you're saying is 
um, to, to put a positive spin on it is how do we as tool builders close that, that gap make that not an asynchronous but you know to me this is an interface problem this is a data presentation this is a data discovery and serendipity problem that you know it keeps me up at, live, at night so we built for example this gbifference tool it's a completely standalone javascript widget that anybody could introduce in whatever software you want all it does is something dirt simple it sends your occurrence id to gbif it brings it back and it puts your fields side by side and you can see the differences and the little flags of that record so to me this was an interface way that we could then introduce into the software so that our curators would, would just simply be able to see what changes the data look like when they went to gbif so for me there's a ton of opportunity it also keeps me up at night to think about how to integrate all of this back i would love to have a bob mizabov standardized format report that i could just drop as a file into our taxon works and it would then auto flag a bunch of reports that would show us the data right that is much better than you know breaking down into 14 steps that he's provided all of these incredible feedback that's that's gone in there so how do we improve that from a data process um standpoint uh hester uh g reference we'll point a link to the source code there um it's a free open source little tool that uh jose built for us here holly i see your hand up yeah, I was just going to add the other thing that we found in looking at the the aggregator feedback is it's not always a straightforward answer to take that and make a change in your data. Often the, there's systematic challenges, both at the data provider le level, what your collections management system looks like and what fields are available to you, what the interpretations are upon ingest into the aggregator. Um, and there's fixes that have to happen at each of those points, right? It's not one change. Um, so it's kind of, I think, an evolving process. And for us on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't do it because of all the things that other people have been saying, but it's something that we're working towards integrating into our workflows so that we can, um, I mean, we definitely want to improve our data. It's just taking time to get there. Thanks. Um... Brian says, I hope that data quality intelligence could be incorporated by, into TaxonWorks in, as a task, similar to the functions found in the new spatial summary tool. Yeah, Brian, we have in TaxonWorks something called soft validations, and there's over 400 soft rules that we need to, we can apply at individual records, but we need to apply that globally. And we've long understood that we need to index those data quality rules to present them at a sort of meta layer. Marcus, you got your hand up. Uh, thanks. Uh, it reminds me of um, annotation systems and feedback systems that have been discussed uh, as long as I can remember. At least I never something came out that is kind of global and centrally really working. But the idea, I think, is still great that if you had a central place where people could uh, annotate structurally, potentially even things and records, uh, potentially have several people people agreeing on something is a, is a good annotation that you could incorporate that change in an aggregator like GBIF or catalog of life without the need to immediately be uh, to do changes in the source databases themselves so as a temporary thing at least also a place where discussions could happen mm -hmm. I I mean, totally... it's, it's a very old idea it's uh, it's just never kind of I think we're slowly seeing that evolve. There's also a concept right. in the ontology world of an object request broker. And so where I get excited is two, two places now. And I, w I hope that everybody can join our geospatial discussion on the third day. But what I get excited about is, for example, the GR bio repository, because that's if we can all reference the URI of that repository, that's seamlessly integratable now into our applications. And I think Symbiota just did this. Um, we know we've wanted to do this, but this is like an annotation that's sort of this data standard. And my hope is that we have a discussion if can we do that for geospatial resolution for um, geopolitical boundaries, which is a massive challenge we're going to talk about on Wednesday. Could GBIF start helping us aggregate some of the names and the geospatial challenges as well there? Um, we have seven or eight minutes, and I think I'm going to wrap it up by trying to making uh, or help, help us wrap it up by taking it even more practical. And, and the last question to follow up with, um, if, if you 
are going to do one simple thing to a data set to improve its quality before it goes out the door, what do you do? You know, we all know that formatting our data and that last 30% of publishing a paper, et cetera, is just a pain. So think hard about the data quality aspect of that before it goes out the data. What's that one simple thing that you do? Dimitri, you want to tell us what you do? For me, run soft validation fixes on the entire project. So for those of you who don't understand soft validation fixes is in Taxon Works, we have these soft validations that can guide you to say, hey, you might be missing this piece of the data, or you know, you, this one is in contrast with this, right? These two statements don't logically combine. And for some of those, then we can encode fixes that will automatically be applied. You can't just click a button and fix all of those in the Taxonworks user interface, but we can run those fixes um, programmatically behind the scenes. Actually, so, for most of them, we have. We have, and, and we have the buttons, have to do it but, one by one. but you have, have to do them one by one, one versus, yeah. yeah. So clicking, clicking buttons, a whole bunch of buttons all at once is what Dimitri's one practical thing is. Others, what is the one simple thing that you do to um, say, okay, it's good enough, it's going out the door? I'll chime in. My one simple thing is when we export a, a Darwin Core file through to GBIF through Taxonworks, I get Tommy to double check certain things. I, 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 I don't do one simple thing. I say, Tommy, you know the data, you understand it, you know what recently happened. Can you please take a look at this? Bob, what's your one simple thing? Um, it's not my data going out the door. It's the data that I get for um, auditing Pensoft data sets. And it's it's almost always the first thing, and I wish people would do it before they sent the data out the door. Please do not use Windows encoding and Windows line endings. The rest of the world and a lot of software programs don't speak Windows. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. And we can get on. We can uh, talk about in chat what that means for those of you who aren't familiar. But but amen to that. And please use UTF-8 too as well. Um, uh, Kat, sorry. I thought Gregory had his hand up first. Oh, sorry, Gregory. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing I do, and I, especially when I'm going over papers, I always make sure that, uh, all the names are correct, you know, whether it be the insect I'm working on or night and the toast, uh, the plant, everything has to have its currently valid name, uh, Otherwise, it it gets lost in the in the database, and so that's that's the main check that I do in in when I'm working with things. Thanks, Gregory. That's that's an amazing practical step, and I think it hints at tools that could evolve to help you do those checks, and not just you, but others. Cat. Yeah. So again, usually I'm working with data on the aggregator side of things, but every now and then, you know, I'm in a position for you know, updating a data set in the IDIC bio IPT, for example. And you know, my like one weird trick um, is I take advantage of the GBIF data validator, which I know it's been mentioned many times over the years that like, oh, they might be phasing it out and it might be deprecated in the future. But they've been saying that for a long time and it still works for me. Uh, so I'll just put a link in the chat. Uh, and I thanks. encourage data providers to use it too. Amazing, thank you. Dima. Uh, I just want to add uh, to what Bob said that um, uh, to be able to use uh, UTF-8 and uh, um, uh, Rose um, engine, uh, line engine uh, correctly, uh, do not use Excel, use LibreOffice uh, um, because Excel is uh, notoriously strange when it deals with UTF-8. If you were playing our data bingo uh, data quality bingo card, you now have the Excel sheet, uh, uh, cell, cell stamped. Um, so I want to oh. thank every, I want to thank everybody. This has been an absolutely amazing talk. Um, we'll, we'll, with your, if you have strong opinions as to not presenting this on YouTube and you participated, please let us know. But I think you'll be able to see this um, on YouTube. Um, I think we could talk for a whole day or two. Maybe we need to have a workshop 
um, where this group of people and their amazing ideas and feedback, uh, I think you're, this, this was very cutting edge to me and it was uh, a lot of uh, great coverage. I want to thank one person in, 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 in particular who made this possible and you didn't hear a lot from her. Debbie Paul um, is completely responsible for uh, cat wrangling you all cats and non-cats um, into this meeting. And so uh, a, a special thank you to Debbie for making this meeting possible and for tying us all together in this, in this uh, meeting. And um, thank you all for participating. Huge, huge, uh, yeah, huge thanks for this amazing session. And we'll keep the conversations going on um, in the next little bit here.